the novel quote, there is no doubt that monotheism caused a great deal of harm to humanity because materialism and atheism were the outcome and the consequence of it. When he's speaking about monotheism here, what he's really talking about is basically Christianity, right? Um, that's one of the few religions in the world that say um, there's only one God and nothing else. We don't really acknowledge anything else. Unless you start looking at the Father, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost as a trinity, and then is that really three, or is that just three aspects of the same one? Okay, but that's what he's talking about here. And he sees materialism, the, the culture that we live in, uh, basically the worship of material goods, and atheism as a direct result of the damage that monotheism caused. Um, because up until the rise of Christianity, and especially Catholicism, uh, people were living in harmony with their environment and nature and all these other forces of the universe. It wasn't until basically Christianity came along that suddenly you couldn't acknowledge the forces of nature and the forces of the universe and all these different laws and things because it was, you know, one God and only one God. So that's what he's talking about here. And we'll see some of that when we look at the different races that have existed uh, on this planet before us. Okay, Gnostic Anthropology. Uh, Gnostic Anthropology, what we're going to look at, Anthropology is basically being the history of our, our race, right? The history of humanity. Uh, it's contrary to materialistic science. So you're going to see a lot of stuff today that doesn't agree with the way science sees things. Um, so you've got to kind of keep it open mind. Um, remembering that science, in many aspects, is composed of theory, not fact, regarding our past and the origin of man. Um, science has a lot of uh, things that are very concrete, a lot of things that can be proven, a lot of things that can be tested. But there's also a lot of things that are just mere theory, right, that become, um, you know, the common theory of the times. And when it comes to the history of our humanity, there's a, a lot of different holes in history. Um, even just basic things like looking at something as simple as the pyramid and the sphinx. Humanity, and sorry, modern science tells us we're talking about three to 4,000 years old. Even though there's a ton of evidence that suggests we're talking 25,000 years plus scientific evidence, right? Uh, science seems very reluctant to rewrite the history of our humanity because to rewrite the history of humanity you basically have to scrap a whole lot of things. The idea that we didn't really have civilizations happening until about 10,000 years old, or sorry, about 10,000 years ago is pretty much accepted as, as fact. But they're doing a ton of archaeological discoveries that are <laughs> suggesting that we've been living in civilizations in large cities for 20, 30, even 40,000 years or more. So there's a lot of stuff going on that, you know, there's a big fight right now in the scientific community when it comes to anthropology and the history of civilization and the history of mankind. And not everybody's agreeing. The model that we have was basically started in the late 1800s. Think of all the advancements in technology that we've had. How come the history hasn't been rewritten to accommodate that? So I personally find it a little suspect to think everything you know, neatly fits in this 4,000-year-old timeline when so many different things point to something much more than that. So that's what I mean by what we're going to see today is stuff that you probably haven't heard of before and in some aspects is, is contrary to what science tells us, what the modern scientific theories are. Um, but remember that some of them are just theories uh, and not, are not facts. So we're going to try to keep an open mind towards that. Um, don't forget too, the Master Simon tells us that one of the things you can do is you can investigate the real origins of our and past civilizations by working with aspects of clairvoyance and looking at the Akashic records. Um, we too have probably <coughs> lives we've lived in previous races. And part of remembering past lives is remembering that you weren't always in this particular race of humanity as well. You can get glimpses of existence that happened before this humanity happened. And sometimes that solves the, the, the paradox that comes up when you think about time, especially when you try to put together you know, these previous lives that you had in different time periods, you find that they don't always fit chronologically into our understanding of how time went and how technology goes. But then when you start realizing that some of these past lives you had were in previous races of existence, then it, it helps um, iron out some of the wrinkles in that whole thing. So, modern science tells us the first humans probably originated somewhere in Africa, and they kind of spread out from there, and they did that a couple hundred thousand years ago, and then we basically lived as tribes of hunters and gatherers until about eh, a little less than 10,000 years ago, we formed the first civilization somewhere near Babylonia and Samaria, and then kind of went on from there. What we're going to find is every planet has seven races, each consisting of seven sub-races. Okay, so basically... Modern science tells us we started in Africa, basically spread throughout the globe in like basically a single uninterrupted movement and basically ended up settling as a civilization somewhere between the Tigris and Euphrates River right in the Middle East. 
modern day Iran, Iraq, which was Babylonian Samaria, and then from there we had the Egyptians, and then we had another civilization that happened in the Indian subcontinent, and then around the world, that kind of thing. What we're going to look at is instead looking at the history of mankind actually consisting of seven races, seven separate chronological events that occurred. Each of those seven races consists of seven sub races. Okay? What was the prominence between <coughs> number seven again? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Remember the law of the Hetaparaparshanok, which is an incredibly awkward way of saying the law of the seven. Remember, the power of three create, the law of seven organize. So the power of three is seen as a symbol for the positive, the negative, the neutral. Isis, Osiris, and Horus, if you wanted to view it from an Egyptian standpoint, or if you want to be Catholic, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing. So once again, we get the power of three to create, and then the law of seven that organize, bring everything into existence. So that's why we see the seven as a prominent figure, even in the Christian Bible as well. After our earth has had all of its seven races and sub-races, the earth basically turns into a moon. The earth itself, <laughs> the planet itself, ceases to exist. It basically dies. And that's a cycle that every planet goes through. Okay, Every planet is in a various <clears throat> stage of existence, um, and we'll look at that in a couple of minutes. But our earth, when all seven races have lived on the earth, we find it's going to turn into a moon, which kind of sounds really odd to say. To make it even odder, our moon used to have life, and it went through a cycle of seven races and sub-races. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of Aboriginal cultures that say the moon is the mother of the earth. And we look at it as, all oh, the earth, the moon was probably some kind of, you know, it's never had life, although we think it's got water, and it's never really had life, and it was probably just formed as some byproduct of the earth existing. But a lot of the ancient cultures say the life that's here on earth came from the moon. Now the moon's dead and it's, there's nothing on there anymore, but at some point the moon was a viable living planet, and when that planet died, the life came and inhabited the earth. So a lot of ancient cultures talk about the moon being the mother of the earth, because the moon has gone through its own cycle of activity as well, and right now it's basically dormant, it's basically dead, but that wasn't always the case. <clears throat> Each planet completes what I'm going to call seven rounds before something that's known as the Great Cosmic Night. We're talking upon cycles and cycles and cycles of existence. We think of a cycle like day and night. That's a cycle we experience, okay? We think of an even bigger <coughs> cycle, what we would call a year, okay, as the planet goes around the sun. We've talked about a bigger cycle before. Remember the Great Sidereal Year, the procession of the equinoxes? That was an even bigger cycle. The Great Cosmic Night is about the biggest you can get cycle-wise. We're talking billions and billions and billions of years is what's comprising a Great Cosmic Night. There's a cosmic day and there's a cosmic night. The Hindus looked at it as Brahma breathing out all of existence and creation, but then later breathes back in, inhales, drawing it all inside him again. So looking at the con continuous expansion and contraction of the breath of God which when you think about it, shares an awful lot of similarities between the concept of the Big Bang and expansion and contraction of the universe, right? The idea that God breathes everything into existence, everything expands and becomes everything, and then later on everything will contract and return to a single point of origin. Okay, that's basically reflected not only in um, <coughs> the origins of the universe and things like quantum physics and that kind of stuff, we're also seeing that reflected in a lot of the world's early religions as well. That's what the Great Cosmic Night is. Okay, when Brahma, when God inhales, drawing everything back into a single source and everything ceases to be. Okay, right now we're in the middle of a cosmic day where all of creation is brought forth. So each planet completes seven what I'm calling rounds or cycles or <coughs> level of existence before the great cosmic night comes. The idea of billions and billions of years of one large cycle of existence and then non-existence and existence and then non-existence again. <laughs> The thing that's difficult to understand about these rounds is they weren't always physical. The Earth wasn't always in the physical dimension. Okay? Earth used to exist in the mental plane, which is the fifth dimension, right? That was where it was for the first round. Then it existed in the astral for its second cycle, existed in the etheric for its third cycle, the physical the fourth. Okay? So we see different cycles going from the mental down to the astral down to the etheric, down to the fifth, what? Hang on. Where am I going with that? Yeah, that's better. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Back to where it started. Those are the seven cycles. Okay, why that's important is because when we talk about the previous races today, there is some evidence of some of the later races found on this planet, but some of the first races, there's nothing physical. And people say, well, if they really existed, then we'd have something. We'd be able to dig them up somewhere and find their tools or their buildings or their architecture or examples of their technology. Why can't we see them? The problem is some of these earlier races existed at these different levels, so there is no physical evidence of them. Okay, some races like the Atlanteans and the Lemurians we're going to look at today, we can point to stuff and say they built that, that's them. Okay, but some of them we don't have any physical proof of because they didn't inhabit the earth when it was physical. So the earth is completing this cycle through seven stages, starting here, descending to the physical, and then ascending back to the mental dimension. So that's another one of these cycles, the earth is constantly moving through different dimensional stages. We've all heard the stories of the cities and the clouds, right? The civilizations and the cities that lived in the clouds. That's where that comes from. The civilizations that occupy the earth in a higher dimension. Remember in the clouds, in the sky, in the heavens? That was always the ancient people just talking about the higher dimensions of existence. So the cities and the civilizations and the clouds just speak of the people that lived in those different dimensions on the earth. Okay, but right now the earth is down here in the physical, so this is all that we really see. Uh, then it goes back up to the etheric for the fifth, the sixth, and the mental for the seventh. So it basically starts here, goes down through seven different steps, back to where it came. That's one great cycle that happens before the cosmic night comes. Our earth has had five <coughs> races already. There has been five previous races of humanity that existed before us. The Aryan race is the fifth of seven. Um, for the benefit of the new people that are here, I have to define this term. <laughs> um, Adolf Hitler wrecked this word for people to use. It doesn't mean what you think it does. The Aryan race describes everybody who is on this planet right now, regardless of skin color, regardless of ethnicity, whatever. Everybody who walks this planet right now belongs to the Aryan race. This is a really, really, really old word. One of the things Hitler was trying to do was cleanse the Aryan race by getting rid of people that he didn't like. But every single person on this planet right now belongs to this race. That's the name for the current race of humanity. Okay, calling us Aryans is like calling the previous race that came before us Atlanteans. It's just a name for a particular race. So it has nothing to do with crazy neo-Nazi crap or anything else like that. There are two more races to come <coughs> after ours is wiped out in the approaching great catastrophe. We've talked about that before. We know at some point this race comes to its end, as did the previous races before it. We know the reason why the races keep ending is because of a large cosmic event, right? And for the new people that are here, it is not 2012. I just need to get that in, so okay, I feel better now. Okay, it has nothing to do with 2012 whatsoever. Um, but we know that there's a celestial mechanic. We know that there's something out there that affects the stability of the Earth's crust and causes a polar displacement or causes a polar shift that creates havoc or problems for a previous race. And we know that they were, we're quite fortunate that happens because that's what affects the balance between the essence or the consciousness versus the ego. Because over time, we know as civilization goes on and on, we become more and more corrupt, we become more and more degenerated as ego pervades society. And we know that when the end of one race occurs, the beginning of a new race starts in its golden era, its spiritual time, just like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Okay, and we've talked about that before. The first race of humanity we're going to look at, this is where things get a bit weird, uh, was referred to as the protoplasmic race. Okay, so they were the very first race of humanity. They were the first beings that walked this earth when it was in a different state of existence. Uh, they existed on the island of Thule, which still exists in the fourth dimension. When you start messing around with the earth in different dimensions, this is where you're going to discover different civilizations of people. This is where you're going to find different people existing in places on the earth that don't actually exist in the physical. Okay, you might have heard of the Island of Fool before. That's something that kind of crops up in, in the popular culture from time to time. Uh, if you're looking for, well, whereabouts would it be? Because people always want to know. If they're trying to visualize the Earth and say, well, where would Fool be? Kind of thing. Oh, maybe I should get that. Oh, no. Parking problems? Oh, 
<laughs> so if we're trying to like in our mind visualize what the planet looks like and we're trying to visualize where things would be uh, you can kind of put Thule near the landmass which currently occupies the North Pole okay so that particular region is kind of where we're talking but remember we're talking about a time when the earth isn't even in the physical yet but people want to think of okay visualize on this planet we are to be, it roughly occupied the area of the North Pole. But remembering that when civilization existed at this level, North Pole wasn't where it was before. Because this Earth, the Earth's crust has a habit of moving and rearranging itself all the time. Uh, that comes as no surprise to people that study geology, because that's exactly what plate tectonics are. We're just talking about plate tectonics on a much higher level. Okay, so remember that our poles always shift and rotate all the time. Um, so the area that we think of as, as basically uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland, that area, at one point that used to be situated on the equator. That was a, a tropical place. <clears throat> as a result of polar shift, and this is going to come up again and again even though I just mentioned it, the structure of the continents on Earth has changed many times. And that's something that we know happens. The difference with what we're talking about esoterically versus modern science. Modern science says plate tectonics happens very, very slowly. Where esoterically that differs, what we're saying is there are times when the plates can shift really rapidly and quite far, basically rearranging the surface of the Earth's crust. Crust displacement theory is what I'm talking about, and that was something that started back in Einstein's time. And there's a lot of scientists now that are talking and exploring about the concept of, of crust displacement theory or polar shift. That at any given moment, for whatever reason, the Earth can suddenly shift quite drastically. We're not talking about a small earthquake. We're talking about the Earth basically tipping on its side, right? That's what we're talking about here. So we have to remember this as we talk about where civilizations are located. You've kind of got to take away that rigid model of what the Earth looks like right now because that wasn't always the case. Because we're talking about billions of years here. We're not talking about this happening a couple thousand years ago. We're talking about millions upon millions of years. <coughs> and modern science as well, you know, humanity basically were, as a civilization, maybe 10 to 15,000 years old. And as a species, maybe 150,000 years old. I'm talking orders of magnitude even greater than that. Um, these are early woodcuts of Thule, just if you're curious. That's a, a one from, um, like, a, a, what would you call it? Um, Nordic, that's what I'm looking for, from an early Nordic civilization. And here's another depiction of the same thing, the world and some monsters and that kind of stuff. So it exists. The concept of an island that had an earlier humanity exists in, in um, common pop culture as well. People are familiar with Atlantis, but Atlantis wasn't the only island or the only landmass that had a humanity on it. Oh, let's get into this. You've seen this before. The Nahuatls say the sons of the first son were devoured by the tigers, and the sons of the second son were destroyed by strong hurricanes and were transformed into monkeys and apes. And the sons of the third son died by the action of the sun of the rain of fire and huge earthquakes and were transformed into birds. They say that the sons of the fourth son were swallowed by the waters and they were transformed into fish. But they don't say anything about the sons of the fifth son. However, if we investigate what will be the fate of the sons of the fifth son, the Nahuatls say how they will perish, and they explain it when they speak about the future. The sons of the fifth son, they affirm, will perish by fire and earthquakes. The hell is all that? The Nahuatls are basically the Aztecs. They're basically an Aztec tribe. What they're talking about here, they're describing the five races of humanity. The sons of the first son were the protoplasmic race. Okay? The sons of the first son were devoured by tigers. This is very important. Devoured by tigers is a symbol for wisdom. They were devoured by wisdom. Basically, the first race of humanity, which we'll see, the protoplasmic race, were a purely spiritual race. They were the gods that walked the earth. All religions have a concept of, at some point, gods walking the earth, spiritual beings inhabiting the <coughs> earth. Okay? That was the protoplasmic race. There was no ego for them. Today we're going to see the origin of the ego as well. There was no ego for this humanity, so consequently they all self-realized. They were pure spiritual beings that continued and ascended into the higher dimensions. Okay? These other races become problematic because this is where we start to see generation. Okay? We see destruction by strong hurricanes and transformed into monkeys and apes. Suddenly everyone turns into animals. What we mean by turns into animals is... Evolution. Yeah. 
right? We're not being able to self-realize anymore and suddenly becoming the animals themselves, okay? That's the process of involution, okay? And then we start seeing things like hurricanes, earthquakes, and that kind of stuff. The sons of the fourth sun were swallowed by the waters. Who do you think that is? Yeah, that's the Atlanteans, swallowed by the waters. That was their fate, and consequently we see them turning into fish, once again, the process of involution. But they don't say anything about the sons of the fifth sun. That's us. The sons of the fifth sun will perish by fire and earthquakes. Okay, so we see the sons of the suns here referring to the different races of humanity and the different, basically, fates that await for them. And the only really interesting one is the one that we're talking about right now, the protoplasmic race, the sons of the first sun, who become devoured by tigers. They somehow escape the hurricanes and the fires and the floods and all that sort of thing. Because this race of humanity basically self-realized because they were spiritual beings. Because at this point, we don't see the advent of the ego. So let's have a look at a bit more about them. See, I'm talking a huge time period here. I'm talking like hundreds of millions of years. And if there was a scientist in the room right now, he'd probably like, he'd be on the floor laughing at hysterics. He's like, there's no way humanity existed three hundred million years ago. It's impossible. Okay? Uh, and, and it's to a certain degree he's right. There is no way this current race existed three hundred million years ago, because we're nowhere near that old. But we're talking about an earlier race of humanity that existed when the Earth was at a completely different level of its own development as well. At this time, the Earth was semi-etheric and semi-physical. So when the first race of humanity shows up, the Earth is kind of like floating in this void between etheric and between physical. It's not quite physical anymore, and it's not quite um, etheric. It's in a process of crystallization. It's descending down into the physical dimension. So consequently, there's nothing you can point to and say that's a remnant of the protoplasmic race. Okay, we can say the Lemurians built this or the Atlanteans <coughs> built that, but there's nothing that we can really say about the protoplasmic because they weren't on the Earth when it was fully physical. They existed on the Earth when it was in a different dimension. They reached a very high degree of civilization. That's something else you're going to see as a common theme today because when we think of earlier humanity, we're going to start thinking cavemen, right? Because that's what we led to believe that our civilization was cavemen, so they must have been, early races must have been like really crude or simple or not very intelligent. That's not the case, okay? Uh, what we're going to see today is they do reach very high degrees of civilization. One of the things that we look at is say, okay, evolution. Um, we see cavemen and we have evidence of cavemen and that kind of stuff. The neat twist that Master Samuel throws at us, he says that that isn't animals evolving into man. That's man devolving into an animal. So what we see is cavemen and Neanderthals and stuff like that are actually examples of involution, of the race going the other way. And that's why we can't find the missing link, because we're looking for something that makes it go up, when in reality it's a path that's actually heading down. And we'll explore some of that stuff today as well. So just because they were an early race doesn't mean they were really basic or anything else like that. They reached a very high degree of civilization, and actually, as I mentioned, this was a perfect race. This was a spiritual race. This was literally the gods walking the earth, the gods physically existing on the planet. Religion, philosophy, and science were totally united in their culture. And I find this quite interesting. To, to reach a high degree of civilization, this is going to be a common theme. Uh, they unite religion, philosophy, and science. For us, you couldn't get three things more diametrically opposed than religion, philosophy, and science. Right? Now think of the fights that go on between you know, religious people, philosophers, and scientists. And even when we look at the different cultures like the Atlanteans as well, uh, one of the keys to being a successful, thriving culture was always uniting these three. These three working together to solve the same problems and answer the same questions. And that's definitely not something that's occurring in our civilization. <coughs> All these things are really looking for the same answer but they're all fighting each other and looking in different directions rather than getting together to combine that knowledge base to actually answer some of those big questions. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, they spoke something that's referred to as the golden language. Um, when you start messing around in the higher dimensions, what you can discover is English isn't like a thing there. There's an older race and there's, sorry, there's an older uh, origin of language and that's something that's referred to as the golden language. And our present languages on this planet are actually descended from this. This is the language which is spoken in the higher dimensions, if that makes any sense at all. And as far as written language, if you're familiar with the Nordic runes at all, they're actually remnants of that. 
Okay, runes were the language that, that's written. So in the higher dimensions, runes would become basically their written language and something that's referred to as the golden language. And this is interesting too because people that study um, linguistics say that at some point um, all the world's languages had some sort of a common ancestor. And even if you think of a lot of the, the uh, Romance languages, the Latin languages, things like Spanish and French and that kind of stuff, there's a lot of similarities, right? At some point we had some unified language that kind of spread out and then changed as different people modified it. This is the root that linguists are looking for, the golden language. That was the original language of humanity. And the original writing was runes. Um, and we still see some of the Nordic cultures actually using that. If you go back a couple thousand years, you can still find examples of, of runes. Um, interesting enough as well, runes also descend from, um, sorry, not descended from runes are also Chinese writing and Hebrew as well. They bear a lot of similarities to early runic characters. And ancient uh, Hebrew is also descent from the golden language as well. Um, so where did these people come from? So all of a sudden there's like people on the earth, like how did they get here, where did they come from, right? They're actually from the higher dimensions. They're actually spiritual beings, remember, that, that send it. Because the earth was in the higher dimensions, they were actually able to like, cross that barrier. Okay, because right now we know there's spiritual beings in the higher dimensions, and angels and gods and all that kind of stuff, and there's physical beings down there where we are, and there's kind of like this barrier that prevents people from crossing. But earlier when the earth was up here, those spiritual beings were actually able to live on the earth. And when the earth was making that change from etheric to physical, they were actually going along for the ride, so to speak. So the origins of this race from the higher dimensions, they were literally the gods on the earth. Okay? Um, their bodies were androgynous and ethereal. What I mean by androgynous is there was no such thing as sex. I'm not talking about hermaphrodite, which has both sex organs. I'm talking androgynous. The concept of male and female didn't exist because these are perfect, balanced spiritual beings. There is no need for a separate male and a separate female because they're spiritually and physically perfect. You can think of it that way. Um, think of even classic depictions of angels in Christianity. They're always pretty good looking guys with long blonde hair, right? The idea that when you look at them, are they kind of guys or are they kind of girls? They have a very androgynous appeal to them. That's because those people that experienced visions and interacted in higher dimensions and see them, that's basically what they look like. There's no obvious sexes. We're going to find out about the origin of the sexes today as well. Uh, what I mean by ethereal is composed of the etheric matter, composed of etheric um, material. So they're not physical, they're not beings of flesh and bone like we are. They don't have to conform to gravity and all this weird stuff that we find affecting us on the physical dimension. Okay, so these are literally the gods on the earth that a lot of the ancient people talked about. Because remember, a lot of the ancient people talked about the gods on the earth, and it was the gods on the earth that were basically our ancestors. They gave you know, birth to our civilization, so to speak. Because yes, in a, in a certain way, we're descended from this race. Um, they could change their size at will, which is something that you're going to encounter once you get good enough at astral projection and you start messing around in the higher dimensions. You'll quickly see that the entities you speak to there can basically be whatever they want. They're not bound by physical bodies. And it's, we, we mean they could float. It's, remember, they're not in the physical. Where they are, there's no time, there's no gravity, there's none of that kind of stuff. This is why when you start astral projecting, you can experience some of these same things for yourself. You can feel what it's like to be in your etheric body that isn't a body of flesh and bone. Remember this whole change size thing? One of our tests to see where we are, to see what if we can make our fingers stretch and change size. So that's just a reminder of the different properties of the different dimensions. Uh, they reproduce like cells do, which is kind of a strange thing. Okay, so like if there's not a separate man and a woman, like where'd they come from and have they pre procreate, right? Um, this is a Strange thing to say, but they, when they wanted to reproduce, they simply did so. They just divided. And that sounds kind of weird that one suddenly becomes two, yet every single cell in your body does that automatically all the time. That's how you exist, because you started out as a single-celled organism, as a, an egg, right? And from that you became you know, billions and billions and billions of cells by division. So it sounds like a strange thing to say. You're just telling me that one suddenly can become two, like it's totally bizarre but you owe your entire existence to that exact same process. Uh, they were devoured by tigers, going back to that quote from the Noatls, the sons of the first son were devoured by tigers. That's a symbol for wisdom. What I'm talking about here is self-realization. These were spiritual beings, they came down to the earth, and then they ascended back to the higher dimensions again. So by the time the earth comes down to the physical, they all take back off 
up to the etheric and continue that ascent. Okay, that's why a lot of ancient cultures tell the stories of the gods that came to the earth and then disappeared back again and then they went somewhere else. That's basically what we're talking about here, the protoplasmic race. The next race we're going to look at is the Hyperborean race. Uh, they were also androgynous. We don't see any division of the sexes here. That comes into play later on, and we'll have a look at that. Uh, they reproduced by budding or sprouting. It's the same kind of idea as separation, which is like something bizarre to think about, but there's a ton of stuff on Earth that does that already. And one of the big things people ask is, well, how come if everybody's androgynous, where are we getting children from? Where are we getting new beings from? Because you need a man and a woman to create, to have children. How do these early beings, how do, you know, when there's no division of the sexes, how do they reproduce? How do they recreate? A uh, similar fashion to plants and corals. They literally just grow into a separate <coughs> organism. Sounds really strange and bizarre, but there's tons of things on the planet that do that already. Uh, they had higher developed senses. Um, they could see elementals, they could see into the higher dimensions, all that kind of stuff. Because at this point we don't see the ego, so we don't see a ton of degeneration like we do now. They're basically still in this transition between the etheric and the physical, so they still maintain some of those higher faculties that we have long lost. We've lost the ability to see, just like we've lost the ability to hear. Right? These earlier uh, civilizations of humanity were basically able to retain those abilities, retain those faculties. Uh, where they live, if you're like, I want to visualize where they were, in Ireland, England, and Alaska are the remnants of the continents they inhabited. So think of that area of the world. Um, remembering that it didn't quite look like that because the whole concept of crust displacement, but if you want to point somewhere on the globe and say, whereabouts was it, you'd be talking these areas. Okay? And think of these particular countries, they have a great spiritual history and there's all kinds of interesting things littering, sorry, littering the landscape of England and Ireland. This is a very, um, very spiritually aware uh, group of people and they always have them. The third race we'll look at is the Lemurians. And the Lemurians are interesting because a whole lot of stuff happens when we get to the Lemurian race. And this is a really weird things too. Uh, we're talking 18 million years ago, so we're talking, once again, big chunks of time, um, which doesn't jive with anything that science tells us about the history of our civilization, but then again, they're trying to make everything happen all in one race, but when we look at things esoterically, we see that it happens over a much longer time period with different races disappearing and then being reborn, disappearing and re being reborn, happening five times until it reaches us. Uh, when we get to 18 million years ago, we're now all the way down here, so... We're now in the physical. We have a fully physical Earth. Okay, it's basically crystallized in the physical, but we've got some problems with the planet. Okay, basically they're seen as a, an instability in the planet's crust. Okay, we're looking at a ton of like earthquakes and volcanoes. There's a lot of instability happening in the planet itself when we get down to the physical world. And that's something that we know for sure, because geologists can tell us that our planet has a really crazy violent history of forming. Yes? Shouldn't the third race be the uh, etheric? Or the etheric? Uh, Sorry? You have, except for the first have mental and the second have the astral. Sorry. Well, the races don't follow this progression. Oh. This is the progression the Earth goes, the races happen in between this. Oh. So there's not a race for everything because then maybe one, two, three, four, five. We theoretically be in the etheric plane right now. Okay, so that's the seven stages the Earth goes through. As the Earth is going through those seven stages, there's civilizations appearing at various points. Okay, there's races of humanity existing at various points. So now we've had the protoplasmic and the hyperborean. We're in this gray zone between the etheric and the physical. Now we get down to the physical world, and now we're looking at the Lemurian race. Okay? The, the thing that really um, sticks out for the Lemurian race is this dilemma right here. We had this weird instability in the Earth's crust, and this is where things start to get really strange. Uh, there was, remember, angels are just names for principles, laws, intelligences, entities in the higher dimensions. There was this intelligence that provided humanity with a means to, or the Lemurians, with a means to basically stabilize the physical planet. Okay? There was, we were basically part of an equation involving an energy transfer. Okay, humans played a vital role because humans have always had one foot in the higher dimensions and one foot in the lower dimensions, right? We sit as a bridge between the spiritual and the physical. We always have. This particular, if, um, the individual referred to as the angel Sakaki, but you can think of it as an intelligence or, or a principle or whatever, gave us this particular 
organ. Do you remember what that is? <coughs> That's the opposite of the Kundalini, right? That's basically the tail of Satan. One of the things that we were basically doing is we were serving this role in this energy exchange. So here's the planet. You guys know my art sucks, right? Uh, here's a representative human being. And here's these uh, forces that exist in the higher dimensions, always symbolized by the sun, the solar forces, right? And here's this planet that's all, uh, this, is, this, this is cracked. <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's basically undergoing this instability. So humanity was able to, to uh, have one foot in these higher dimensions. So we became an energy conduit. We became like a wire in the circuit. So somebody said, wait a second. We've got this energy that these things can take, that this needs, so let's just plug, let's plug that thing into there, and then these energies can then transfer to the center of this physical organism. Okay? That's where the origin of the ego comes in. And that's what we're looking at right here. We have the higher dimensions above us, which is basically, you know, there's God, for lack of all things, up there. We have this descent of energy that reaches the physical, where it stops. Where that energy needed to end up was in the mineral kingdom, the infernal regions. And that's what we know is the nine levels below us, right? The mineral kingdom down here, the seven infernal regions, also known as the nine levels of hell, right? You guys must be wondering what the hell is going on right now. I feel really bad. <laughs> he was looking at me like, what the hell did you walk into? Um, so what this individual, this principal decided to do was let's use humanity to connect A to B. And that's what the Kundar Tibador organ was. It was an energy conduit that allowed this higher energy to transfer through us into the lower regions, okay, which gave that earth the stability it needed. Because remember, these lower regions is analogous to the mineral kingdom. The problem was, while we were plugged in, this energy conduit was supposed to be one way. That energy was supposed to flow down from the higher dimensions, flow into the lower dimensions, and basically stabilize the planet. What this guy didn't know, or this law, or this intelligence didn't know, is while this connection was made, it was also a two-way street. Something came up. What do you think came up? The ego. Yeah. The ego, which we know is a product of the lower regions. And that's what happened. While humanity was plugged in to stabilize this, so while the Lemurians were acting as this energy conduit, it wasn't a one-way street. Something else was able to come back up and basically act through the consciousness of the Lemurians. What came up was the ego. So what we just discovered is the origin of the ego. Is you know how did you know how does something that's negative and you know dark down here how did it get into humanity in the first place? That's what you're looking at. We sit here in this bridge. There's nine levels above us, nine levels below us. Humanity has always straddled both of those two kingdoms. And the energy has always flowed through us. It was supposed to be a one-way exchange, but ended up becoming a two-way exchange. And that's where the ego came in. And that's how we ended up with the Kundartibador organ. Okay, so that's the origin of that negative stuff. This individual, by the way, got an and probably the most karma that I think any being has ever received ever when you think about all the problems that this created. The plan backfired. And by then it was okay, let's let's cut this. Forget it, bad idea, bad idea. Too late, the ego is already there. The Lemurians had already fallen, they would already given to the temptation, and they already begun a cycle which still repeats with us today. Okay? So that's where the ego came from. It was part, believe it or not, of a failed experiment to use humanity to can basically convey energy to the planet at a different level to stabilize the planet. Yes? Assuming all of humanity were to be able to remove the Kundar Tegador, uh, wouldn't the planet then again destabilize? No, because it's done its thing. Yeah. It's done its thing, it's got what it's needed, and eventually the planet's going to go back <coughs> the other way anyways, and it's going back into the etheric. So it's going to move up dimensionally. Yeah, that was something that just needed to be at one point in the Earth's development. When it just crossed that border from the etheric into the physical, it was crystallizing and had problems. They fixed it, they went, great, everything's fixed, let's get rid of this, and discover why can't we get rid of this? How come this thing keeps growing back? What did we do? And that's when they realized, is they introduced the ego into humanity. So what used to be a pure spiritual race became poisoned. Okay, poisoned by those negative energies because we were physically plugged into 
the lower dimensions. We were transferring energy from here all the way down to there, but some of that energy came backwards. Okay, and we literally became poisoned with the energy of the lower dimensions, and that of course poisoned our psychology and gave birth to the ego, the concept of the I. Okay, so that whole process worked as in the earth stabilized, but when the higher beings tried to remove that connection, which we're calling a tail, for lack of a better term here, uh, we'd already basically seen the formation of the ego as a result of that. Too much of that negative energy went the other way and basically corrupted humanity. So Lemuria is where we start to see a lot of the influence of the ego acting over the hundreds of thousands of years that Lemuria existed. So as a consequence, that whole concept of the tale of Satan, remember that's what we always depict the Kundar Tigridor as, that's where we get the concept of demons have tails, that's why the Lemurians were the last semi-spiritual humanity. They were the last illuminated humanity. Okay, with them, uh, humanity basically loses its divinity. Okay, we're no longer a perfect race anymore. We got trapped by this illusion in the physical world, we got trapped by the illusion of the ego, and consequently, this is the last illuminated humanity. The races that exist after this and the end of the Lemurian race, we're basically looking at imperfect beings now with all the problems that brings. <clears throat> In the beginning of the Lemurian race, uh, before the ego formed, the people were very simple and innocent, just like the races that came before them. There was no corruption, there was no degeneration. They were a superior humanity with a powerful <coughs> civilization and technology. Okay, because this a reminder, once again, just because they were early humans doesn't mean they were simple or dumb or anything else like that. They were more advanced than we are right now, believe it or not. Civilization existed on the continent of Mu in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is the point where we should say, wait a second, you're saying the Lemurians, this is a fully physical world, so, like, where were they? I want to see them. Um, Easter Island is a remnant of the Lemurian civilization. The statues on Easter Island were made by the Lemurians. So those, those things on Easter Island, these guys, they're the Lemurians. Okay, they, they've always baffled humanity. And there's many things about that civilization that baffles humanity, the Rapa Nui. Um, they weren't <coughs> part of our civilization, that's why. Um, these were Lemurians. And it is said uh, that these statues were built every time somebody ascended and became a master. And that entire island, the statues all look out on the water. And that was shown as basically mastered the waters, right? Mastered the sexual energies. And every time one of them ascended, they built a statue as, as a way to commemorate that. That's apparently the origin of these guys. Um, if you want to figure out where it is, that's where Mu would be. Remembering that we're talking about the Earth's crust moving around a lot. So this is the current Asia, Australia, and America. And the Pacific Ocean had this big landmass in the center. There's Easter Island and Hawaii and all that stuff is actually part of that. So there's the Samoans and all that kind of stuff. So the Fiji Islands are in here as well. They're all remnants of this large landmass that broke apart when the Earth shifted a long time ago. This map is given as 70,000 BC if you're looking for a time reference. The first half of the Lemurian humanity were hermaphrodites. <clears throat> so something else happened when this energy comes up into humanity we start to see something strange physically occurring. We start to see the development of separate sexes. Okay, because with the polarity of that energy, we get separate sexes. In a perfect being that's united and in perfect balance, there is no female, there is no male, because those energies are perfect. It's when the energy becomes unperfect that it starts to polarize. That's, you know, leaning more towards the negative or the positive, which would be more towards male <coughs> or female. So we go from pure spiritual beings that are androgynous to now suddenly seeing hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites basically means both sex organs at the same time. So we start to see a division of the sexes. The ancestry of humanity were hermaphrodites, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but that's kind of why men have nipples. <laughs> right? It's like a weird thing to think about, but in the womb is a fetus, we're basically a hermaphrodite. And it's later on that we split up into either separate male or female. Why that occurs is because the ancestors that we share, the physical flesh and bone ancestors that we share, were also hermaphrodites as well. They had both sets of sex organs. And over time, so we're talking like thousands of years of Lemurian civilization here. We're talking about evolution of the sexes on Lemurian scale. So we're not talking about overnight, but as Lemurian civilization, hundreds and thousands of years of their civilization, we start to see from hermaphrodite eventually splitting up into two distinct separate sexes. 
So over time, eventually, myriads were born with one sex or organ more developed than the other. After a whole bunch of time of evolution, we get two separate sexes. So we start with the previous races being fully androgynous, no division of the sexes, because no screwing up of the energies, because we didn't have the ego. We get to the, the Lemurian civilization, we introduce the ego. The first effect we see of the ego is a division of the sexes, a polarization of the creative energies. You can think of it that way. Okay, we start to see a polarization of the creative energies. Fast forward a whole bunch of time of evolution on Lemurian scale, now we've got separate male and female. Now that we've got separate male and female, now we have the ability to lose the energy, which is what the ego is after the entire time. Because with an androgynous being, you can't lose energy that's perfectly balanced and contained inside you. It's suddenly when we become male and female that we need to now exchange energy. Because females need what they don't have, males need what they don't have, so they have to unite to exchange energy, and that's the ego's opportunity to actually take that energy. This is the origin of Eve created from Adam's rib in Genesis. Okay, because even the Bible says there was one sex, and then Adam got bored, and God took his rib, and then, oh, he made a wife, and there you go. Um, that's what we're talking about. The early talk of Genesis in the Bible is describing the Lemurians. Adam and Eve were the Lemurian males and the Lemurian females. <coughs> the fall of the Garden of Eden and the fall of man is about the Lemurians uh, degenerating. It's about the Lemurians getting kicked out of heaven, becoming no longer a spiritual humanity, and instead becoming a fallen humanity. The book of Genesis is all about the Lemurian race. It wasn't Adam, some guy, and Eve, his wife. It was all the Lemurian men were typified by Adam. All the Lemurian women were typified by Eve. Okay, and at that point, the serpent in the book of Genesis is that right there. It's the Kundar Tigodor. That's the tempting serpent. Uh, the story of Adam and Eve, cast out of Eden, is about this race and its last days in degeneration. So if you go back and read the book of Genesis, and this time put the filter on it that you're reading about an earlier race of humanity, and the process it went through, suddenly it makes a lot more sense. Suddenly there's more things that jump out when you realize you're not talking about one guy and one woman and they gave birth to everybody. You realize you're talking about one race of all the males and all the females. The separate sexes, combined with the development of the ego, resulted in the abuse of sexual energy. And that's something that wasn't possible until the Lemurian race. This is where we start to see people falling. This is where it gets weird. In the final stages of sexual degeneration, because Lemurians didn't look like us, okay? The Lemurians didn't have these similar bodies that we have. Turns out the Lemurians mix with lower animals to produce the intellectual animals. So there's that missing link. So yeah, we're descended from apes in the ascent that in other lower creatures in that uh, it was a higher being that basically messed with the animals to produce us. Which kind of has a lot of similarities between people that say that humanity was created by some sort of higher being, like an astronaut or something, right? That's one of the theories that, you know, astronauts came and they messed with the genetics of the animals and they created the human being. It's kind of a similar idea that we're born out of the combination of a spiritual being and a physical animal. Sounds wacky until you go back and look at a lot of the stories of the ancient Greeks and Romans. And it always talks about how the gods took a physical body and impregnated a physical a woman, and that gave birth to this man slash God, the half man, half God, which is all of us. Okay? So it's the same kind of idea. Um, the Lemurians were huge. Uh, the stories that you'll also see that are common around the world is when giants walk the earth, right? That's another common story. There's also a race of giants. A lot of the Aboriginal cultures, a lot of the early civilizations talk about the old gods, the race of giants that walk the earth. That's the Lemurians that they were talking about. And they lived a really long time as well. If you're looking for some sort of a correspondence, you live for lucky 80 years. These guys did 1,200 to 1,500 years. That was normal for them. So these are like the superhumans, basically. Uh, Herculibus destroyed Lemuria. It took 40,000 years of earthquakes and volcanoes to finally destroy the continent. So we're not talking about waking up one day and discovering that you're no longer there. In this case, 40,000 years of, of uh, geological instability rearranging the planet's crust before Lemuria was basically wiped out, before the planet was, or the continent was submerged and everything was all rearranged. 
That brings us to the fourth race, which everyone's usually familiar with, and that's the Atlanteans. Primitive cultures of our race have their roots in Atlantis. They're descendants of the Atlanteans. Okay, so the Egyptian civilization and the Mayan and the Aztec civilization, they're descendants of Atlantis. And it kind of makes a lot of sense when people always say, well, where was the island of Atlantis? And we're always asking, you know, well, where was Atlantis? Where was Atlantis? Um, oh, here we go, part time. <laughs> Hat right there. That's North and South America. That's Florida. You like that? That's England. Finland, and that kind of looks like this. And there's Spain and Mediterranean, and then Africa kind of looks like that, right? Yeah, that's it. That's good. Eh? <laughs> so that's Europe and that's Africa. What's this? What's this big body of water that sits in between them? Atlantic Ocean. Where do you think Atlantis was? In the middle of the freaking ocean that carries its name. It was a big landmass that sat right in the middle there. Um, now, when Atlantis was basically going under, when they were having problems because of the whole um, instability of the uh, continent as it was falling <coughs> apart, where did they go? <coughs> they went here, and they went here, basically into Egypt and um, South America. That's why there's so many similarities between their stories, their myths, and their architecture. That's why there's pyramids here and there's pyramids here. Because they were basically built by people that shared the same descendants, and that was the, the Atlantis. And it's funny, people like, where, where was Atlantis? Where is the Atlantis? Why do we have an ocean named after it? There's a reason why it's called the Atlantic Ocean. Anyway. Uh, all religions, or sorry, all religious teachings of primitive America, uh, the sacred cults of the Incas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the gods and goddesses, the Greeks, Scandinavians, Hindus, etc., etc., are all of Atlantean origin. That's why a lot of the world's religions and stories and fables carry the same message. There's a reason for that. It's a common theme. Okay, we're descendants of a uh, culture, a civilization, a race that existed before us. And those survivors, those with the awakened consciousness that were able to flee this decaying civilization, resettled and took with them their knowledge of their culture and their history and their architecture and all that kind of stuff. The islands of the Antilles, Canary Island, and Spain are pieces of Atlantis. So this stuff that we see floating around in here is what's left over. Okay, so that's bits of that used to be really big continent that have broken apart. Our civilization has yet to surpass the Atlantean civilization. We're nowhere near where they were. One of the big things that we'll see the Atlanteans did is they were able to do a lot of cool stuff with nuclear energy, which we haven't even touched yet. Uh, this is a, kind of a difficult to see map. Um, it's way better than my map, though. Uh, this is basically uh, North America right here, there's Hudson's Bay, there's South America down here, there's England, there's Finland, Norway, and Sweden, there's Africa sitting right here, and this is all of Russia. The red splotchy bits are what the Earth looked like at the time of Atlantis. Okay, this big red blotchy bit that sits in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean right there, that was Atlantis. So that big landmass that fit right inside North and South America, that one right there, that was Atlantis. Okay, and these red bits are basically all that's left, the Canary Islands and the Antilles and that kind of thing. <coughs> okay, so this area was submerged and the only thing that existed was the red blotches. But then as the Earth's crust shifts around, some places get raised, some places get lowered, and then we're left with what it looked like today. But this whole continent of Atlantis was basically submerged. And this is an ancient Greek <laughs> depiction of the island as well, of the continent of Atlantis. <coughs> Uh, they knew about atomic energy. They had nuclear boats and airships, atomic lamps illuminated everything. They didn't use electricity, everything was nuclear for them. So lights were basically nuclear. Uh, they had robots, which is kind of like a goofy thing to think about. And this is kind of cool. Um, they talk about how they could transmit electric intellectual information telepathically. And I was wondering what that would mean. I never really understood how this could work. And it's something I've always been curious about because they were incredibly intelligent and managed to surpass us technologically. And I was wondering how that was possible and you know, how we could get ourselves to that point. And then it kind of um, had some experiences where this dawned on me how this was being. Imagine right now if your brain was hooked into the internet and you had access to all information simultaneously. We're getting pretty close to that. That's what they were basically able to do. Um, what we have with the internet, they had a basically a highly advanced version of that that, that was like Wi-Fi to our brain, basically. 
So for them, it wasn't, they didn't have to learn things or anything like that. They were actually capable of absorbing this information. Okay, so if you can imagine yourself being permanently hooked into the internet and every time you wanted to know how to do something, you just automatically found the page that did it and basically learned everything on that page. It's kind of what we're talking about here, transmitting intellectual in information at a telepathic level or at a wireless or electronic level. Uh, this is interesting. One of the things that they managed to tackle, which we haven't figured out yet, is gravity. Gravity is a force that we're really not very good with. We can control all of our forces. We're getting pretty good at controlling nuclear forces. We've harnessed electricity for a long time now, but we haven't been able to harness gravity. <coughs> they were able to do that. Um, with small devices, they were able to lift massive weights. And when people look at things like the pyramids, they say, well, how was it possible you need an army of thousands of people and take hundreds of years to do that? If you're going to lift everything the old-fashioned way, but what if you're able to basically to lift rocks as if they were nothing? They were also able to have um, a technology that allowed them to take stone and metal and basically turn it into something like putty. So we look at some of the early examples of metallurgy in the Egyptian culture, and we still don't know how they did what they did with gold. We're like, wow, for them to make that gold sarcophagus a toot in common, you're talking about you know, a high degree of metallurgy that we really yet to master ourselves if we're talking about dealing with metal. One of the things the Atlanteans were able to do is alter the states of solids and liquids at will. So imagine something like gold becoming something like putty that you could easily mold with your fingers. Imagine something like rock becoming something like you know styrofoam that you could carve and ship away quite easily. Yeah. That's one of the things that they were able to do. So they were at a different level from us technologically. <laughs> Uh, they built the pyramids of Egypt in South America. They are also responsible for Stonehenge as well. They passed through three terrible catastrophes before it totally disappeared. So once again, a period of, of degeneration and uh, um, geological instability before the continent totally disappeared. The first one roughly 800,000 years ago, the second one about 200,000 years ago, and the third, third one, final one about 11,000 years ago. Isn't that curious that our civilization pops up all oh, about that? Okay, so this is you know, something to reflect on when modern science says, well, you know, there's no way we, we could have been around 10,000 years. Just kind of, a civilization appeared out of nowhere 10,000 years ago. Well, we go back a bit further and we see that this didn't appear out of nowhere. It was an extension of something else. And that's around about the time we start seeing civilization crop up here and crop up there, which is kind of interesting. Remember the Atlanteans were swallowed by the waters? Remember the sons of the first sun were swallowed by the water? Um, that's the universal deluge, um, the great flood of the Bible. Uh, that's something else that's common to a lot of world religions as well. This concept of a great flood showing at some point in some time of history, it was quite a serious flood that impacted a very large civilization that all points back to the Atlantean roots. And that brings us to us, the fifth race. Uh, that's who we are. Um, remember, each race had seven subraces. We've looked at the Atlanteans, and they, they each had seven subraces. We didn't examine the subraces of the Atlanteans, because we don't really know a lot about them, and it doesn't really matter. But we can look at our seven subraces, because these are quite familiar to us. The first subrace flourished in the central plateau of Asia, basically Tibet and the Himalayans. What I mean by subrace is that's not the only place where there was humans. We're looking at the, basically the driving force of the civilization at that time. So think of a subrace as being a center, a hub <coughs> of art and culture and learning and that kind of thing. Okay. So the first time we see that crop up after the Atlanteans is Tibet and the Himalayans. The second one is India, Southern Asia, and China. That's the next sub-race. And these, you can, these won't be a surprise. You can probably guess the rest of these. You see Babylonia, Chaldea, and Egypt. And after this, Rome, Greece, and Italy. The fifth one being uh, basically Europe. The sixth one being uh, starting down here. The Aztecs, the Mayans, the Spanish. And the seventh, that's us. Yay. We're the seventh of seven, which is good for us, but bad in that we're the last of this particular race. Okay, all races mixed to form the seventh subrace, and that's what we see right now in North America. That's where we are. Basically, a combination of all of these existing. We are the melting pot. Uh, we will be destroyed by fire, volcanoes, and earthquakes. That's the whole concept we talked about earlier when we looked at Aquarius and prophecies, the idea of polar shift and that kind of stuff. We know at some point that's coming. It is not 2012. 
Okay, no 2012. Uh, the sixth race. The sixth race, we know a little bit about them. Uh, they're referred to as the Core ID. And they're currently in the process of development because we're on our way out and the next race is on its way in. And what's said about this race, this is one to make you think, it will be a mix of earthly beings and those from outside of this world. You can interpret that as alien if you want, or you can interpret that as extra dimensional if you want as well. Okay, so that's a mix of earthly beings and the spiritual, those that are outside of earth. And that'd be that, and there's nothing said about the seventh, because that's, that's a long way away. That's really far down the road. Any questions? Yes? Um, so is the ego going to be like dissolved when we end, this race ends? Uh, and then well, make that mistake again the, the problem is the ego is the kind of here to stay. So I don't know what will happen long term, but we know that with the other races, every time the race ended, the ego died out, right? Because only those with the consciousness awoken basically escaped the disaster. But the problem is, the more time they spend, eventually they, they give in to the influence of the ego again. Right, so we see when a race begins, so let's say Atlantis is degenerating, it's dying, the Earth's all messed up, this continent's going down. Those with their consciousness awoken, basically fled, settled in areas that were going to be stable, so they could basically pass through the disaster. So all the degenerative people die, basically these cultures are now ruled by those with the awakened consciousness. That's the Golden Age. When the Golden Age comes, you see a lot of beings from the higher dimensions that have been waiting to take a physical body, they'll now come down because there's less risk of corruption, because there's less ego. But fast forward into this civilization, as time gets stronger and stronger, the ego starts to make its appearance again. And that balance shifts from spiritual <coughs> and eventually ends up to where we are right now, which is in the Iron Age, which is predominantly ego, very little spiritual. And then everything happens, resets the clock, and that starts over again. Yes? What do you mean by, like, take a body? Do you mean, like, they're born in through... Like us, like actual being born, or do you think like just being taken by your own? No, um, there's a part of us that, that there's basically a divine side of ourselves. There's like a spiritual side of every person, and that's what's taken from the moment of conception. That like baby, if you want to call okay, it. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, was yeah, we're not talking about like a possession thing where someone right. just comes in and takes it. We're talking like <laughs> from when we're born. Yeah. <laughs> so, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, with what you said about the seventh race of seven. Um, that would imply that in the the thing you were describing, the Brahmic breath the in and out. Yeah, the cosmic oh, day and cosmic night. Yeah, would would that imply that the that at some point in the next like well short, not from our perspective, but like hundred thousand years would be the point at which Brahma would start to breathe back. Well, I don't in. know if you've been keeping track of some of this, but we're not talking hundred thousand years. We're only talking like hundreds of millions. Of Oh, okay. There's a number, and I can't remember what it is. There's an actual number for the uh, the length of a great cosmic day, and it's like 18 zeros or something like that, days. It's a oh. huge time frame. Like each of these races, we're talking about millions of years, right? So, yeah, there's two more races to go, give or take a couple million years each. We're talking like a long time frame. Okay. So, yeah, it's not for 2012. Oh, no, that's, what I was, that's not what I was thinking. I know, but as far as like races of humanity we would be one of the like I like the last three races to experience before everything would start contracting yeah That's and then at some point everything is born again into existence right it's just a huge cycle of expansion and contraction which is the same thing as a great as a big bang we figure that the universe has exploded from nothing and now there's evidence to suggest that it's contracting again going back to the same point of origin, that singularity that the mm -hmm. physicists are looking for. Yep. So, we, is it possible that we reincarnated from another race, or, or can you reincarnate again into another race? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of you are in previous lifetimes. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be 108 in this current race. And that's the weird thing, is when you start trying to put together the time pieces of previous lives, they don't add up because you go back two or three lives and you're like, wait a second, go back two or three lives, that's at least, say, each life is about 75 years, so I should be talking about 225 years, so that means we should be talking about sometime in the, what, late 16, early 1700s for that life, but 
it's not like that. It's not that kind of technology. It's not old timey. It's a different place. Where the hell is that? And then you realize that you're dealing with um, races, not just down to this physical race. So you're talking about Lemurian or Atlantean as well, which is kind of neat. No, yeah. Not only masters can re reincarnate, right? Yeah. We are reborn. Again. Yeah, and that's the thing. When you say, you say reincarnation, that implies coming back by will, and that's for an awakened master. We're stuck by return and recurrence. We just get stuck in the machine at some point. But a master can wait to take a physical body, and they can wait <coughs> to the golden age, and they can say, this is when I'm making my run for it. This is when I'm working on my solar harvest, and I'm going to develop my solar bodies, my golden bodies. I'm going to do it now while the ego's influence is at a minimum. Yes. Do you think that he's going to come back? Uh, he said, believe it or not, that's one of the things that he said. He said, I will be back. And he apparently trained his son to how to recognize him when he comes back. Oh, oh so, so he wants to come back soon. Yeah, he's going to come back soon, apparently. Maybe he's back here know. already? Maybe, you never know. There's apparently there's <laughs> masters on the earth right now working yeah. among humanity. There's just nobody running around saying, you know, I'm a master, I'm a master, because they become a big target for But them. if they're working, like, what would they be doing for us? Helping us through the mm -hmm. transition? Or, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Helping those people that need the help and being where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Not every master is running around saying, I'm a master, listen to what I have well, to say. Would they know or they have to discover it? No, they, they would be aware of that. They would be conscious. Oh, that's right. They'll they're be conscious. Okay. Yeah, remember, he was fallen. He had to go through that whole process that we had to go through. Because he was a fallen bodhisattva. He wasn't conscious of what he was. He'd fallen. He had to climb the ladder back up again. But there's other masters that are on the planet that they're fully conscious of what they're doing. They're spiritual beings like here. Um, some of them have this, this is, it gets weird, some of them have the same body for thousands of years. They just prolonged the physical body. Yeah. I've never met any of those. So. <laughs> Interesting.